So I took Beth on a date, and we went to a concert. Anybody heard of Laura Story? Yeah, I see some heads nodding. We went to hear, hear her. Um, and how many of you have heard the song, Blessings? Okay, a number of you have. I'm going to pull up some words. It's a beautiful song. It says, we pray for blessings, we pray for peace, comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while, you hear each spoken need. Yet love is way too much to give us lesser things. And then the chorus, because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? Second verse is good too. That's, that song has been a blessing to me, and one of the reasons I wanted to go to the concert. Um, and Laura's story is a very humble person. Um, but you know, a lot of things that, that mean something to us mean more when we understand the context. And that song meant a lot to me, but then when I was at the concert, she got to share with us the context. Where did that song come from? I came out of her, but from what experience? And that's when she told us she'd been married for not very long, maybe a couple years, am I right, Beth? Not even that. She said they'd hardly got the china put somewhere in their house. Um, then they got a diagnosis that her husband had a brain tumor. Um, they were able to operate. But, I mean, Beth and I kind of know, and others, you guys know what it's like going through these things. It's not like you hear a diagnosis one day and you're fixed the next. Um, it takes a lot of time, and it can be very, very trying. And that's a context for this song. So now this song means even more to me, and when I think of it, I know the story behind it. Um, and Scripture is the same. When we look at the context of, a, of Scripture, sometimes we'll either find a deeper meaning, or we may even find a meaning that we didn't even know was there when we just isolated that verse and read it by itself. I'll give you an example. Well, I'm going to give you a quiz, okay? Uh, we could have the verse, 1 Corinthians 2.9. I don't know if we're... There we go. You've heard this verse before, right? What do you think is the context for this verse? Anybody? Without opening your Bible, what context have you normally heard this verse in? Heaven, right? Do you know the context has absolutely nothing to do with heaven? But that's almost always the context we hear it in, okay? And I'm not saying it doesn't apply to heaven because it, it does apply to heaven. But the context is completely different. Do you, want, do you know what the context is? The context is the wisdom of God and the mysteries of God. And he is going to reveal those mysteries through his spirit and show us things that we haven't heard, that we haven't known. That's the context, which is still wonderful. It's a wonderful promise that he's giving us. But sometimes, especially... When we, as Adventists, we proof text, and I came today to proof text a sermon on stewardship. But that's not what you're getting. Because you know what? The cook has to cook with what's in the cupboard. And God gave me something different. Okay? And so I have to give you what God gave me. Um... But sometimes when we're into getting our proof text, and that's what I was going for, we don't always think of or catch the context. And we're going to look at the context of something, and it might surprise you. Maybe you're going to think I'm off my rocker, and that's okay. Um, but let's look in the book of Malachi. And before we open it, get any further, let's, let's pray. 
Father in heaven, we're going to open up your word. We're going to dig in. And I pray um, that your spirit will lead and will guide and that we will understand uh, the content and context to really understand the message um, here in Malachi chapter 3. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Malachi 3, verses 8 to 10. If you've got a Bible, you can turn there or be on the screen. I can't read behind my head, so I'm going to look in here. And the screen, the monitor in the back doesn't work yet, so I can't read it there. or It's not connected. And there's no clock, so the good news is I don't know when I need to stop. Bad news for you, good news for me. Okay, so this says, Will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. So the, con the content is what? Tithes and offerings, right? We usually just say tithes. We forget that there's offerings mentioned too. Um, and so that's the content. But what is the context that we usually don't hear? Is this some contract that God has made with us? Hey, we'll do this trade. You give me tithes and offerings and I'll pour out blessings. Is that what it is? Some kind of contract we enter in with God? I'm going to tell you something. This, these verses have nothing to do with money. But pastor, it says tithes and offerings. That's money. Oh, maybe you mean like it's talking about a tenth of my goats in my herd in my garden. Maybe that's why you're not saying it's money. No, I'm saying it's not anything that you can bring to God or hand in at a church. That's not what this is about. And that surprised me this week. And an experience I'm going to share at the end finally made sense to me after I understood this passage. So we got to know what is the context of this. We, we tend to jump right into it. And I want us to, I want to back up. Oh, should I start at the beginning of chapter 3? Or chapter 2 or chapter 1? I think maybe I'll go back to chapter 3 of Genesis. To provide a little context. Well, I'll get there. I'll back up slowly. Okay, the timing of Malachi, we don't know exactly when Malachi was written. Is the Bible chronological? Absolutely not. Okay, but Malachi, being the last book, actually may have been the last book written in the Old Testament. Um, and so people think that it's sometime after Nehemiah and his Reformation. You might remember that God had sent prophets to Israel or to Judah and they had rebelled. Finally, God said, if you don't listen, I'm going to send you into captivity. They wouldn't listen. So off they go. Where do they go? Babylon. They go to Babylon. Seventy years. And in Jeremiah 29, 11 is the context for, the context of this is the captivity. It's always nice to get context for things. Jeremiah 29, 11, they're in captivity and God gives them the message, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. So yeah, you're in captivity, but I want you to know I have good plans for you. I have a bright future for you. That's the context of that verse. And so he's brought them out of Babylon, 
And Nehemiah comes. He hears things aren't going so good. So he goes. And yeah, it's a mess. And he gets the, the temple set up, the priesthood set back up. And sometime after that, maybe a century later, maybe less, is Malachi. And Malachi sees a mess. Um, but God has already been, he was calling people back to himself, calling them to himself and they wouldn't listen, so he sent them to Babylon trying to get their attention. And God has always been trying to get people to come back to him. That's why I want to go back to Genesis. And we're not going to look at any verses, but Adam and Eve, when they rebelled against God, what was God's response? They were hiding. What's God's plan? What's God's intent? His intent is to get them to come back to him. Amen? And he knew to do that, he would have to promise a Savior, his own son, Jesus Christ. We go, I'm not going to cover, I'm just going to jump here and there through time. Um, but we get to the time of the judges. And in the time of the judges, they follow God, then they go away. God sends judgment. The judge comes, helps them to deliver the, the people. And it just happens over and over again in the book of Judges that they go away from God, God calls them back. They go away from God, God calls them back. And then they have the audacity to say, we want a king. And you remember how Samuel felt. Samuel felt like it was on him. And God said, no, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected who? They said, they've rejected me. They've rejected God. And so after these goofballs are back and forth, going away, coming back, going away, coming back like a yo-yo, and now they offend God to me even more, saying, we, don't, we want a king. We don't want you the way you want to lead us. And then we get this king time, and we've got them, a good king leads them, the next king leads them away, back and forth, this yo-yo again. I don't know about you, but I would get tired of that. <laughs> I mean, it's sometimes people do something to us, yeah, we'll kind of let them off the hook, and they do it again, and are like, our fuse is getting a little shorter. And so you would think that God's fuse would be getting shorter over all of this time. All of this back and forth during the kings, and he sends them to captivity, as I said. After so many times of this, how does God feel? Let's look at a few verses. Hosea 11. Hosea chapter 11, after the book of Daniel, and verses 7 and 8. Verse 7, my people are bent on backsliding from me, though they call to the most high, none at all exalt him. So this is the situation, they keep backsliding, yes, they in name say they're following me, but they're not. Again, how does he feel? How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? Such patience. They rebel, he still wants them back. Let's go to another verse, Jeremiah chapter 49. Another verse I like, Jeremiah chapter 49. It's probably already on the screen, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. It's faster than me. It's not fair. I queued them up. Okay, verses 15 and 16. No. Yes. Okay. Do you know what? That happens, and I hate it when it happens. Beth, do you know what verse I want? Thank you. Chapter 13. It didn't spell check that for me. So Jeremiah chapter 13. 
Oh. Are you sure, Beth? Oh. Of Jeremiah? I think we're not on the same page. We need another date. No. Okay. Well, thankfully God has patience with me too. Oh, I think it's Isaiah. Let's try Isaiah before I give up on this. Yes. Sorry. Isaiah. 49. We'll do verse 14. But Zion, or God's people, said, The Lord has forsaken me, and the Lord has forgotten me. Oh, I'll wait, let you, well, you're in your Bibles. So that's good to hear the pages turning. It says, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will what? I won't forget. And who is he saying this to? People that have just been really, really nice to him? Really sweet and faithful? No, they've been, they've been bad people. And he's saying, I can't forget. It's impossible. Verse 16, see, I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. And so all through this time, leading up to the book of Malachi, this is what's been happening, rebelling God, calling back, and he says, I can't forget you. You're my kids. I don't care how many times you leave me. You're my kids. I can't forget you. Let's go to one more verse before we really focus on Malachi, and that is Luke chapter 13. You guys are thinking, boy, I wonder if he's got it right. 13.34, I do. Luke chapter 13.34. This is Jesus talking. He's coming to the end of his ministry. He knows, he knows how things are going to go. And he says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. And so he says, he's saying this, I think with tears in his voice, I have sent you many, many messengers you killed them, I sent another because I, didn't, because I didn't want you scattered. I wanted to pull you in to me. I wanted you to come back to me. And that's Jesus' desire as he was there and he knew that the leaders, the religious leaders weren't going to go for it. And it made him so sad, it broke his heart. So this is, that's giving context to some of the years before Malachi. Let's turn to Malachi, if you've got your Bible and are, are looking there. Um, we're not going to have many more verses on the screen. Most of it I'm just going to highlight quickly. You may want to read the book of Malachi this afternoon. But Malachi starts out with a great verse. I love verse 2. I love you, says the Lord. That's a nice message, isn't it? I've loved you, says the Lord. And so that's how it starts. But then we get to verses 6 to 14, and I'm actually going to read all of these. A son, verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where's my honor? If I am a master, where's my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts, you dis, you, to the priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised you? Despise your name. You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? Or why have these offerings been unacceptable? 
saying, The table of the Lord is contemptible, and when you offer the blind as a sacrifice and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? So if you gave this gift to a human leader, would they like it? Obviously not, and you're giving it to me. Come on. In verse 9, But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Who is there among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord. No, will I accept an offering from your hands? Why is he not going to accept an offering from their hands? Because the offering that they're giving is not what he's asked for. They're giving him the, they're giving him the, the junk. They're keeping the best for themselves and giving him the leftovers of the flock. Um. In verse 11, for from the rising of the sun even to its going down, my name shall be great among who? The Gentiles. In every place incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So they're giving bad offerings, okay? Their worship is kind of on their terms rather than God's terms. And God wants them to be a light to the Gentiles, and are they? No, they're, being, they're making his name bad. But yet he wants all the Gentiles to be worshiping him. But they're not leading the way God wants them to. We'll read a few more. Verse 12, But you profane it, in that you say, The table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit, its food is contemptible. You also say, Oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick, Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. And so their worship is not true worship. They're not being the light that God intended for them to be. They're not carrying out his mission. That's verses 11 and 12. Um, I'm not going to take you through it, but from verse 13 of chapter 1 to 13 of chapter 2, he's talking about the priest. He's talking about the poor spiritual leadership. Um, Then before we get to chapter 3, he's talking about judgment that's coming. And this is his message he's giving through Malachi. And then let's look at chapter 3, verse 7. And so I'm trying to set up the context. It says, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. That's what we've been talking about, right? All the examples of along the way they've kept not following what God has said. Yet what does God want? He wants them to come back, right? I'll tell you, someone told me something recently. And that is when they are disagreeing, they said, as long as I'm still talking, you can know that I feel that there's hope. If I don't feel there's hope, I won't talk anymore. I'll just be done. God is still talking, isn't he? He's still talking. He still sees hope. He still wants them back. And so he says, return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. So his heart, his deep desire is still that this people, this nation, has not followed his plan, has been a pain. He still wants them. Return to me is his plead to them. And they say, and I would say this too, okay, well, how do you want me to return? In what way shall we, shall we return? Now the answer. Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. 
but you say, how we robbed you in tithes and offerings. And then verse 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. So this, these verses that we proof text are a response to, I want you back. How do we come back? Bring your tithes and offerings. Does that seem a little odd? What would you expect him to say to that answer? Well, how do we come back? Maybe go to church. Read your Bible. Do service. Reach out. Do outreach. Those would be a little bit more logical, what we would expect God to say when we say, well, how do you want us to return? Not give me money. You want money? That's how you want me to return? That seems a little odd. Does it to you? It did to me. But that's his answer. Bring the tithes and offerings. You've stopped giving them. I want you to give them. That's how I want you to return to me. So, he's not asking them for the best lambs. He's not saying, hey, you've been a bad witness. I want you to be a good witness now. He's not saying, hey, we've got to get the spiritual leadership under control. That's how I want you to return to me. He asks for their tithes and offerings. Why should we give tithes and offerings? I'm assuming that you guys think we should. I'm not trying to prove that today. Is it because we don't want to rob God? Now, that seems pretty bad, to rob your Creator. Is that why we should return tithes and offerings? Is God running out of money? <laughs> and so he says, hey, I'm running a little short. Let's, let's fill up the, the coffers. Is that why he, he asked for our tithes and offerings? I want us to look at a verse in Matthew. This is a verse Beth and I were discussing recently. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. I did it again. Oh, no, I didn't. I thought I had the wrong verse again. Okay, Matthew 6, 21, for where your what is, treasure is, there will your... Okay, if I had asked you before reading it, which came first? Does it, the treasure follow the heart or the heart follow the treasure? What would you have thought or what would you have said? We might think the opposite that the treasure is going to follow the heart. But what did Jesus say? The heart follows the treasure. Jesus says where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. In that order. Did he get it wrong? I don't think so. Where our treasure is, our heart will follow. And God is after our heart, not our money. But to get to our heart, he says, I know how to get your heart Get your treasure in the right spot. And then your heart's going to be in the right spot. That's why I'm saying God in here in Malachi is not asking for money. He's asking for us to get our heart in the right place. He's saying, come back to me. I want your heart knit with mine. I'm asking for you to treasure me. Because I know your heart's going to come if you'll do that. God is wanting you, friends, and knows if you will choose to share your treasure with him, he's going to get your heart. I may have shared this story with a few of you. It's about someone that's very precious to me. Maybe it's better that Ariana's not here. <laughs> um, because I've got two sisters. One of them is Ariana's mom, who myself along with everybody in the world that knows her, truly knows her, finds her challenging to love. And I've got a sister that's easy to love. And God is helping me with Ariana's mom, 
He's still working on me. <laughs> My other sister, though, I love to death. Sherry. Um, Ariana's mom is Sarah. And Sherry... Sherry grew up in, of course, the same house. She went to Adventist schools. She gets done with high school, with academy, and as often happens, she chooses to drift away from God. Uh, and I'm not going to get into how she's drifted, but she's whew, way drifted, okay? And I know she's a lost girl. There's no doubt. She's a lost girl. And of course, as you know, of people in that situation in your family, your heart aches and you cry out to God that they could be saved. And I decided I'm going to consistently pray for Sherry, pray for me to consistently pray for Sarah. I haven't chosen to do that yet. I, my heart's, there's some work that still needs to be done. But I was consistently praying for Sherry every single day. Okay, you know, sometimes we make that commitment and then we kind of, it lasts a week or two. Well, it, it lasted months. Every day, God, reach her, God, reach her, God, reach her. And she calls me after a few months and she's all excited. This is like 15 years ago. Oh, more than that. And she called me and she says, guess what? I've decided to start tithing. <laughs> you know, I thought maybe going to church would be a good idea. I thought that would be a first step. Or I've decided to read my Bible or something like that. But instead she calls me and says, I've decided to tithe. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I was excited, very excited that God had touched her heart. I just didn't think it would be touched like that. I never would have asked for it to be God help her to start tithing. I probably would have said, God, if I wanted to be specific, get her back to church. But that's how God's spirit worked. And his spirit did work. And his spirit has been working. And when I talked to her last week, she is going to a small country church and that doesn't have a Sabbath school teacher and she's thinking she'll be the kid's Sabbath school teacher. Amen. So far from where she was. What was her first step? Tithing. <laughs> Who would have guessed? You know, I've heard a number of people here say, follow the money trail. If you follow the money trail, you're going to get to who's really wagging the dog's tail, right? Follow the money trail. Then you're going to find out what the true motives are. So, if someone followed your money trail, what would they find? If your neighbor, if a co-worker, if a stranger off the street got to look in your finances... You gave them the login to your online banking or you handed them your bank statement. And they, what would they say your priorities are? Where would they say your treasure is? Someone that doesn't know you, just going based on the money trail. Would it be obvious that you treasure God and his kingdom? Or would they say, based on this, I'd say they treasure something else. If they would say your treasure is somewhere else, what are you going to do with your next paycheck? Because God is asking us to return to him, and he says, I want your money. Why? Because our heart is going to follow where our money goes. Because, you know, my sister Sherry, she had been vacillating for years. God, not God. God, not God. God, not God. 
But her decision to say, I'm giving my tithe to God, was a statement, was a, a decision, I am choosing God. And God is asking for that commitment from us. And that's what it's about. It's not about the money. It's about the commitment. The commitment of our treasure so that he can get our hearts. Remember, God is calling all people, even church people, to return to him. The book of Malachi, is this to believers or unbelievers? It's to believers, right? Believers that are just totally out there spiritually and he's asking for them to open their wallets in commitment to him. Many resist and are doing this 50-50 thing, one foot in the door, one out, like Sherry was, but God is calling you and me to a deeper commitment to him through our financial treasure. Will you be like Sherry? Maybe you've already been like Sherry. Maybe your whole life you've been like her. Maybe you have been, you've been off and on. But I'm asking you today, will you be like Sherry? Will you do the same and make that commitment to Christ? Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts.